Good morning, everyone. Uh, and thank you, Governor, for the wonderful introduction. Um, I see my screen change, so I hope you can hear me. Um, I am going to talk here today uh, about some of the data we have statewide. I'm going to talk about some of the um, uh, data we have specifically for Madison County, and then I'm going to talk a little bit more personally after that. Um, and I will give you an update as we go along here. So let's do this, share my screen. So I think as we all know, tragically opioid um, overdose deaths and substance uh, use disorder deaths are on an alarming trajectory of increase. Um, all the way back to uh, when I was the president of the American Medical Association in 2015 to 16, when we were talking about the scourge of substance use disorder and overdose death, then we talked about 68,000 deaths a, uh, overall and 68,000 deaths a year, I think at its peak, we are tragically going, to, we have already wildly exceeded that last year nationwide. Uh, and it appears, unfortunately, that that pattern is continuing to um, escalate. I, I want to share the data about where we are as a state, but I also want to enlist our ongoing efforts and thank you for all the work that this community has done so far. When I finish my presentation and when this is over, the next presenter, I think one of your other keynotes, uh, Dr. Zabel has spoken uh, to one of our um, sessions that we just had for our harm uh, reduction summit. And will give you all sorts of wonderful information and, and very firsthand personal uh, stories about the folks that he has interacted with and the important work that he and others have done uh, to try to help us through these difficult times. Uh, I want to reassure us all, though, though there are great difficulties, that we're not powerless to change the trajectory of this crisis, and encourage you all that your work is incredibly valuable, that you help people um, on a daily basis, and that if we do pull together uh, and work with our communities at large, that we can make this problem better, and hopefully one day um, eliminate this as a, the crisis that it currently is. So I'm going to share some data here with you. Uh, from 2019 to 2020, uh, the problems of drug overdose deaths have escalated profoundly. Across the United States, there's been almost a 31% increase year over year in overdose deaths. And if you look at Kentucky, Kentucky, West Virginia, and South Carolina uh, are three of the worst states in, in the uh, United States. And on this, this particular representation, um, Kentucky is the worst with a 57% increase in drug overdose death. If you look at numbers and spe uh, specific detail in Kentucky, we've gone over a four year period from 1,477 deaths all the way up to 1,964 deaths last year. That's almost a 50% increase in, in that time frame of 2019 to 2020. That's a huge leap in just 12 months. And of course, there are a lot of things that have contributed to this. As the governor mentioned, the stress of the COVID pandemic has certainly, certainly contributed to social isolation at times. Uh, during the initial period of the pandemic last spring, and probably early summer, people avoided the emergency departments for fear of probably catching an unknown disease. And all of these things contributed to the increase in overdose deaths but, but another really substantial contributor is the arrival and expanded availability of synthetic opioids such as fentanyl, which have made uh, these drugs uh, much more lethal and much harder for people to use with regularity without the risk of overdose. Another alarming trend, of course, is that the use of methamphetamine and, and multi-drug or co-ingestion uh, use has increased and that obviously further adds to the risk to the user uh, and further adds to the potential lethality of their use. So here, when we look at Madison County, if you were just to look at the ranking, Madison County went from, unfortunately, the fourth highest drug overdose rate of 120 counties in Kentucky down to six, but it's not because Madison County got better. Madison County actually got 30% worse than the previous year 
the reason Madison County dropped two points uh, or two slots um, for our counties is because the crisis escalated so much more rapidly in some other places. And so you see here counties like Knott County, which is all of these are off the chart. All of these are tragically off the chart, but at 121 deaths per 100,000, that is um, really, really obviously a horrible scourge. So fentanyl, as I mentioned, makes uh, overdose uh, much more likely and makes these drugs of abuse much more risky. Um, you know, I'm an emergency physician and I practiced 19 years uh, post-training and I practiced uh, 13 and a half or so of those years right in Lexington at St. Joe East. And uh, these, these synthetic opioids are not like heroin. They're not like morphine. They're not even like Dilaudid uh, or hydromorphone. These synthetic opioids are far more potent um, and it is alarmingly easy for uh, folks who are selling these substances illegally to lace and co-mix these different substances and create a cocktail that is immediately lethal even to the most um, tolerant individual who has become um, acclimated to high opioid exposure. Uh, tragically, in, in my experience in the emergency department, because St. Joe East is right off the 75 corridor and you can, you can get at it from, from both the east and the uh, south, um, we would see folks come in with overdose and I'd have to go out and um, help extricate them from their cars uh, out in the ambulance breezeway. We could tell almost when new shipments have arrived, had arrived in the state because we'd go from a relative calm to potentially two or three overdoses in a day out of a hundred people we might treat that day. Uh, so fentanyl uh, and su fentanyl and other analogs of it are, are a horrible, horrible scourge. And you can see here, even in Madison County, how that increased dramatically year over year. And when we look at the overall rapid escalation in deaths in the state, um, central and central eastern Kentucky have been hit particularly hard. And you can see here, um, really alarming rates of increase in Jefferson County and Fayette County as well, uh, where we have some of our largest population densities. So I'm not going to dwell on this slide, but I think what it shows is that a, a different data source for emergency department use, that, that overdoses in uh, Madison County, non-fatal overdoses, continue to be very prevalent. Uh, it varies from year to year, but most of these numbers uh, vacillate within a fairly consistent range. Um, and, and part of the big challenge, again, is that some of these overdoses have just become much more lethal because of the nature of the substances being used. Uh, probably coupled with the social isolation and other stressors of the pandemic. And here's where a picture tells a thousand words. You see the straight up the, the line here for February of 2020. And it's obvious to see that um, the changes of the pandemic uh, really brought about a, a turbocharging of this crisis. And it's going to take some really heavy duty effort and, and a lot of, um, a lot of, um, changes, hopefully with the pandemic at some point receding for us to be able to uh, get ourselves through this. We've lost ground very tragically and it's gonna be difficult to recapture it, uh, but I know we're all committed to doing that. Um, for the uh, 12 months ended May, 2020, there were 81,000 drug overdose deaths, at least in the United States in the 12 months ended May, 2020. It's the highest ever in a 12 month period. And uh, let's hope that 2021 does not set any new record there uh, because obviously that is a tragic loss of human life. If we look at the profile of actual drug overdoses in Madison County, uh, you can see here that stimulants uh, as a, a contributor to this have increased substantially um, from six, uh, six people with stimulants uh, involved in their fatal overdose in 2016 up to 34 in 2020. Um, that has been a steady uh, incline over these last five years on this table. Um, and again, it represents a really serious challenge. Uh, fentanyl is dangerous enough by itself. Uh, you couple the fentanyl with methamphetamine and you start to get um, a cocktail that the most um, vibrant person is unlikely to uh, survive. Um, if we look here, at one of the really important efforts that's part of our harm reduction initiatives in the syringe service program 
in Madison County, the utilization has gone up substantially. So this should say participants here, I think, but we've got 165 participants in 2019 that has skyrocketed to 482 in 2020. On this point, um, I really want to draw our attention to the importance of these needle exchange programs, these syringe service programs, and, and ask and enlist your active assistance in making sure that the community leaders locally understand why these are important. I, I have this concern about potential backsliding that we've seen a glimmer of in some counties here in Kentucky. It's very hard for some to get past what they believe to be the enabling of a voluntary behavior because people don't fully appreciate, certainly I don't even think fully appreciates the right term. People do not have an awareness of or an understanding probably at all unless you suffer from substance use disorder, just how irreparably these chemicals alter your brain and how much they impair your decision-making ability. And so I don't, for, for some that is interpreted as people are making bad choices and therefore bad things happen to them. And, and that is just clearly in my experience of over 20 years of being in healthcare, that is not what happens with substance use disorder, whether it is opioids uh, or alcohol or other substances, the brain chemistry is altered in ways that your voluntary uh, decision-making capacity is profoundly impaired. And it does require a very comprehensive approach to try to help people overcome that difficulty. For syringe service programs, this is just like the title of the program, Harm Reduction, uh, is incredibly important to avert other harms that come as collateral uh, consequences of uh, injecting drugs and using um, illicit substances through drug injection, where hepatitis and HIV can explode into local and regional epidemics very quickly if people continue to use dirty and contaminated needles. I don't think folks appreciate what this means unless you've been in an EMS unit or an emergency department, or you have worked with the substance use disorder community very personally in these harm reduction initiatives or as experts in the field, just what it looks like to see someone who will continue to inject, even with dirty needles, even knowing the consequences that are attendant to that and have golf ball and softball size abscesses overlaying numerous vascular areas on their arms and their legs and even their neck. And the difficulty that that represents for them, the high risk entailed for all trying to drain those and the risk of loss of limb or function uh, of their limbs, uh, the damage that can happen to the, the heart and the valves uh, in the heart, the uh, small but, but real occurrence of people having endocarditis that requires open heart surgery for valve replacement or other interventions, prolonged antibiotic use uh, in order to try to treat these sorts of infections and bloodstream infections. Folks don't appreciate and understand just what that looks like, the horror that it is for the individuals afflicted with these problems, and ultimately the extensive additional cost that accrues to society, trying to deal with those consequences and the difficulties getting enough uh, trained clinicians to treat these individuals due to the very difficult um, circumstances attendant to their compliance or their or non-compliance uh, with treatment and, and the difficulties that go with this. And so these syringe service programs are absolutely essential if the Commonwealth of Kentucky is not to have massive outbreaks of HIV, hepatitis, and other diseases. And I try to remind people, as much as folks want to think uh, that um, this is limited to someone else, probably most people know a friend or a family member who's been afflicted by this problem. And probably uh, many people uh, don't acknowledge or aren't aware that their own son or daughter uh, may have sex or become exposed to these individuals who have these diseases. And it is not limited to only individuals who use IV drugs, but also 
people who interact with them intimately in other ways. And so those diseases can spread into other communities uh, much more easily than people uh, give credit. So, so let's all please make sure we're engaging with the local decision makers. Don't take for granted that the programs you have in place in your community um, are always assumed to be secure. Please take the time and the effort needed to engage with your local leadership at the city and county level to make sure they're aware, involved, and, and engaged in what um, they need to know for the value and how we are helping people and why that is so important. Now, this shows the number of syringes distributed in Madison County. And you can see in one year, this is escalated profoundly. Now, they have a pretty good recapture rate here, um, which looks to be on a rough eyeball, uh, well, over 80%, 83% or more. Um, it is really, really important. And, I, and I'm aware of, of the additional thinking on giving out as many needles as folks need. But let me point out for us all, it is really imperative. We get these return rates as close to equal as we can, even though I understand that is not always possible and that there are numerous reasons why it is not possible and outside our control. But folks who are skeptics of syringe service programs point to these sorts of statistics and say, this is why needles are sitting in public parks and this is why needles are in public spaces that others are then exposed to. We have got to find ways to continue to drive up that return rate um, because that is a metric that, that others in other decision-making roles in society use as, as a rationale for why they end syringe service programs. Um, and, and we have to continue to refine our messaging uh, why the, the return rate that we don't capture, the amount that does leak out, is, is still well worth that leakage in order to capture the many, many, many other benefits we have. So here we can also look at another example of just how bad this problem has become. Look at that staggering increase in the amount of kits distributed for Narcan at the Madison County Syringe Service Program. It's gone from 71 kits in 2019 to over 1,600 in 2020. This is astounding. And, and it is unfortunately a sign of a community in distress in a community that, that is crying out for help. And folks, it's not, there is no easy answer here, but, but I have to continue to urge us that we do have proven strategies and things that we can do to help. And, and some of the speakers who present to you later today will go through those. And, and let's all please pull together as best we can to find ways to help those who are suffering already and find ways to minimize the creation of new individuals who suffer from substance use disorder. We also see an increase in the number of HIV tests at syringe service programs across the state. I want to give a shout out to uh, the CURP program that embeds at numerous health departments across the state. We, we're very grateful for our partnership with them. Uh, we use, um, that's a part of our harm reduction efforts um, in, in associated with our Ryan White HIV AIDS program. Um, uh, CURP does really great work across the Commonwealth to try to provide additional and enhanced services uh, to uh, individuals who come into our syringe service programs uh, to try to help ensure they have access to testing and other resources that help to minimize their risk and help to try to get them um, into assistance within the community. So uh, CURP is operated out of the University of Kentucky and the Kentucky Department for Public Health is very grateful for our partnership uh, with the leaders of that program and grateful for the work they do. Let me also, while I'm making that point, give a shout out for and, and, and just a real heartfelt sense of gratitude for the 61 local health departments that serve all 120 counties in the Commonwealth. Those health departments are an invaluable resource to all of our communities for programs such as this and many other programs. Uh, let's please make sure we communicate to our legislators and our local uh, leaders, just how important those local health departments are and do our very best to support them uh, and encourage the public to, to assign the value to them um, that they deserve so that we can make sure that they are there properly staffed and available to support our communities so that we can make for a healthier uh, 
Commonwealth, um, not just for substance use disorder, but for a variety of other uh, um, conditions. Madison County has a wealth of resources to help individuals who have substance use disorder. This is not comprehensive uh, by any means, and it certainly doesn't even include primary care providers who provide uh, buprenorphine and, and Vivitrol. So thank you to the uh, clinical community and the primary care um, community who helps uh, support folks. Um, you can also do a Google search, uh, which is, is very helpful because some of these resources change over time. And so that's probably a good way to at least get a sense for what's out there and, and new uh, changes. Um, but if you uh, know someone who needs help finding the best fit for treatment and navigating all the details of making it happen, uh, there are also some programs in place specifically uh, within Madison County. And here's uh, some of those for you. I imagine these slides will be available to you after the fact. So hopefully you don't have to jot all this down, but uh, there it is for a screenshot if you need it. Uh, if you were to reach out to any of these uh, entities, I'm sure that they would do their very best uh, to be helpful. The, the harm reduction team at the health department has a recovery coach program, a recovery coach rather, and some program staff who are available to provide support to people seeking treatment. And they also offer um, sterile syringes, rapid HIV and hepatitis C testing, Narcan, COVID vaccines, and information about how to stay safer if you're injecting. Uh, the Spark Ministries helps patients with Casey's Law, as well as provides support to anyone who wants to explore treatment options. And New Vista's Quick Response Team is available to respond quickly after someone is overdosed to provide immediate support and resources, as well as helping anyone interested in treatment. So these programs are familiar uh, to many, um, and they are familiar with all available treatment options and are able to help individuals and families make choices about what might be a good fit for them. So I'm gonna end this slideshow here. And I have good news and bad news for the rest of the group at this point. Uh, the, the good news is I have Dr. Connie White, our deputy commissioner uh, from KDPH with us. Uh, Dr. White has committed countless hours in working with our program um, uh, at the, the Kentucky Department for Public Health to make these programs available to folks uh, and to be a resource across the state. It's a privilege to serve alongside her and I'm very grateful for her leadership uh, in all of these efforts. Um, so the good news is that Connie is here with us today. The bad news for me is that because the COVID pandemic has escalated and because there are crises unfolding, I have been pulled to a different meeting here at 945. And so I'm going to have to depart a half hour earlier than I had planned. Dr. White is gonna stay behind and finish the Q&A uh, where I'm unable to conclude. So I, I have about seven minutes where I'm happy to take the questions that you offer me. And then Dr. White will seamlessly step in and you will trade up to someone who is truly an expert in these things from the public health perspective. So uh, for those who are uh, conducting this, how, how do you wanna do the questions? Uh, Dr. Stack, this is Travis Witt with the MORE program. And we have a handful of questions in the Q&A. And before we get to the Q&A, I just wanna offer a sincere thank you for being part of this conference today and your efforts in the public health world do not go unnoticed. So thank you so much for, for everything you do. Um, we have three questions in the Q&A right now and people, we are running out of time. So if you have questions, put them in now, but we have two questions concerning the role of fentanyl testing strips. The first question is, can you talk about the role of fentanyl testing strips in the public health response to overdose and how are communities around the state using this tool? The second question suggests that there may be a liability concern with local health departments when it comes to fentanyl testing strips. Um, and if other health departments are distributing them, how are they doing so? And is there ways to negate that liability? So those are great questions. This is a great example for why having Dr. White here is, is, is really valuable because she's um, very well aware of these, these issues. But fentanyl, the first part I'll address, the, the fentanyl testing strips are really valuable because they, they at least help a, a substance user um, check to see if what they're getting may have fentanyl in it. And they may be able to um, exercise some additional degree of caution um, to reduce the risk of overdose at least. Uh, the federal government, I think, did not even permit or fund this until just recently for us. There were restrictions that prevented the widespread use or adoption of this. 
Um, some of that has recently changed and, and we are accommodating and adjusting to that as rapidly as possible. And I think some of the concerns people have with liability is probably part of this journey as we're trying to navigate and figure out those, those details. So Dr. White, you wanna bat clean up on that for me? No, you, you're right on target. Uh, fentanyl test strips have been used uh, for decades or as long as they've been around to help people understand what uh, substances they, are, they have purchased uh, and to help them, as you said, uh, determine dosage, to determine uh, not to use alone, to be sure that there is naloxone available if they are going to use. Um, the federal government has not allowed any federal monies to be used toward purchasing fentanyl test strips until this year. And I think that was when they began to understand how uh, it's just another critical tool in our toolbox to keep people alive. Um, the liability issue, uh, we are, uh, we, we have put together, we, the core group, which is similar to the Moore group, but the core group at the cabinet has put together a real nice uh, one pager document that we've sent out to all of our SSPs so that they have that information that people can have. I know people are posting signage. The real issue is if I test and it says there's no fentanyl and there is some funky analog that somebody in some laboratory somewhere pulled together and it misses that, what kind of liability is, uh, is there? Uh, I, to our knowledge, and we're reaching out to national experts, we've talked to our attorneys, we, we recommend people talk to their, their local attorneys because we are not the attorneys for the SSPs. But at this point, if, uh, if, the, if the client is, is uh, advised that this is not 100% uh, and that there could be something missed and that they are avail aware of that, uh, that relieves the local health department of liability and we are continuing to find more and more information we can share with our SSPs. Uh, I do know that there are SSPs in the state that have been giving uh, out uh, S uh, test strips for a year at least, probably longer, um, and feel that they, could, they couldn't operate their SSP without that extra level of safety and protection. So it is something that we're pursuing. Hey, let me, let me jump in real quick, um, Travis, because I'll have to drop here, unfortunately, in two minutes, but I, and leave my parting thoughts. And then Dr. White can handle all these other questions. So you're in, you're in wonderful hands here. I saw the question about stigma and I wanna address that. And then I wanna leave some more general thoughts. This is hard. This is really hard because people are accustomed to, oh, I make a bad decision um, and it's my fault and then I'm responsible for it. I, 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 tell, I tell folks, I tell you know, younger nieces or nephews or people in my family, there are some mistakes you just cannot afford to make. You, you do want some of these things once or twice, and that could put your life on a path that is forever um, impaired. Um, and, and of course, I'm referencing statistics now from years ago, but the whole problem of prescription drug, um, prescription drugs becoming a route for people to have substance use disorder. Uh, we have such a scourge there where there was such an overabundance of prescription opioids and it's a complicated journey because people started, I, I know there's the whole issue with pharma and, and, and all those are, are important issues, but I, I was a practicing emergency physician during the time when we were told that people's pain was undertreated and there were hundred million people living in chronic daily pain that impaired their quality of life. And, and other policies were put in place to compel clinicians under threat of financial consequence and other consequences to treat pain more aggressively. And in our healthcare system, which has substantial flaws in it, um, using opioids was the tool available for an alarmingly large number of people. And then you saw a decade of absolute escalation in the creation of new people with substance dependency which may or may not be the same thing as substance use disorder, uh, depending on the individual, but at any rate, the two are uh, connected. And we have some serious challenges for how do we address making sure everyone has fair and equitable access to healthcare so they can get the proper treatment that's most effective with the least risk. And so in Kentucky, at least 
We should, I think, be grateful that we have Medicaid expansion, that the governor was committed to that, and that we are working very hard to try to increase access to healthcare services for all persons so they can access uh, evidence-based and good care and not have to use tools that have other consequences. My parting words as I have to, to go are, um, please be kind and, and considerate to people as we go through this COVID pandemic. Um, we are in a real pickle now and hospitals are really buckling at this point in time. If, if you do not have to be at a hospital for an optional procedure or surgery, please don't go. Um, go there if you have an emergency, but otherwise, please do not go. Um, if, um, if you can um, encourage people, please, it is time for folks to stay away from each other again. Wear your masks whenever you're in public. Get vaccinated if you are not, because the people overwhelmingly dying are unvaccinated. Um, and, and please listen to the public health guidance we're giving you. We could all get through this a lot better if we pull together as a state. Um, and right now, I think we're suffering the consequences of not pulling together as well as we need to. So, so please, let's, let's all pull together and, and get that done. Um, I've got to go. Um, thank you very much, everyone. Dr. White will take great care of you. Thanks a bunch, everyone, and Connie, too. Thank you so much, Dr. Stack, for being with us. Um, Connie, would you like to continue the conversation when it comes to strategies to address the stigma in our local communities? I know that's a big kind of a loaded question, but anything we can do at the local level to address that, that stigma that Dr. Stack focused on? You know, every uh, um, different community has what works for them. Uh, I think the more we can just talk about this, we make this uh, so it, it's not a, a secret. I mean, I, I go way back to when you didn't talk about breast cancer. And I don't know how many of you do not remember Betty Ford, but Betty Ford came out and said, I have breast cancer, I'm having mastectomy. And, and as, as minute as that sounds, that was earth shattering. And Betty Ford had pictures made when she was in her house coat and her husband giving her a hug. Uh, this was taboo in the 1970s. You, you, for you younger folks, that just sounds absolutely comical. But it was because somebody stepped out and talked about their experience. And I think the more we talk about this and we make this part of the conversation that this happens to everyone uh, and this is something that we all need support in, I think that from the communities I've seen, as more and more people discuss this, uh, the more real it makes it. Uh, and I saw a bumper sticker the other day that I love and I'm trying to use in all my presentations. It said in big print, human kind and in small print it said be both so we need to be human and we need to be kind and the more we talk about this we will get more and more converts if you would of people understanding this is another medical condition that we need to be compassionate about and help each other uh, but it, it's just something that every individual community needs to address and figure out what works for for them uh, I will say, and, and this is going into the question someone put in the chat about um, PrEP uh, and do SSPs provide PrEP? And for those who don't know, PrEP is a medication you can take if you're HIV negative, but have a lifestyle that you're concerned that you could become HIV positive, and this helps to prevent uh, HIV uh, infection from developing. Uh, and the other question was, are any SSPs doing wound care uh, clinics to help people uh, that might need some, some more medical assistance uh, that are actively using? And the answer to both of those questions is, yes, those are possibilities. Uh, we have some new funding from Kentucky Core here in the cabinet, uh, our, our behavioral health, uh, the Department for Behavioral Health and Intellectual, Disab uh, Intellectual and Developmental Dis Disabilities has funding from SAMHSA. Uh, and we have funding that we are calling our enhanced SSP grant application. Some SSPs have applied for this funding to do wound clinics. Uh, we do have one uh, health department that is already doing PrEP even before they had a wound clinic. So these are all marvelous opportunities that we can help your local SSP flesh out and help get you the resources uh, that could be used for providing these services in your community. And I also want to thank all of the SSPs and, and the other treatment programs. I've been on calls with treatment programs across the state. How you have adapted, I, I, I want 
I want a t-shirt that says pivot is my new word. I mean, I feel I've pivoted so much in the last year. I feel like a, a prima ballerina. I mean, we have pivoted all over the place, making our accommodations to keep people safe because of substance use disorder usage and safe from COVID. Uh, SSPs and, and your, your local treatment programs have provided uh, vaccinations. They've provided safe uh, interactions so that you can uh, non-touch interaction, bringing your, your syringes in and getting those back and, and helping people still get testing for HIV and hepatitis C. We haven't talked much about hep C today. Critical, critical in the state of Kentucky that we keep get people tested so we can get them into treatment right away. In the olden days, we couldn't treat you unless you were six months uh, of sobriety. Fortunately, we have been able in the state of Kentucky to, to kick that uh, out the window so people can get treated for hepatitis C if they need to get treated for hepatitis C. So all of the work that's been done by all of you in this community in the middle of a, a COVID pandemic you, you've done an amazing thing to reach out to folks and you're we're learning from each other think, you know you'll hear someone say well we did this well I never thought about yet that yeah we could do that too so this has been a great population that's pivoted and I just can't thank you enough for that work that you've done thank you so much Connie uh, we're getting a few questions specifically about the demographics affected by opioid use disorder and substance use disorder um, one question is, what is the most common age range for individuals? And then we've got a question about other types of demographics, men, women, young people, minorities, et cetera. Uh, do you see any trends in that area at the moment? Yes, actually we do. I mean, it has always been more men than women. Um, and we are seeing, uh, as we've seen throughout this pandemic, more in Eastern Kentucky. Um, and when we look at neonatal absence syndrome uh, reports, and when we look at our overdose deaths, uh, the, the, the uh, damage is more in those areas where people are, are uh, uh, either using going to the hospital uh, or having an overdose death. Uh, but that has spread throughout the state over the years. And I've started working this in this, this field in 2015 when uh, SSPs were first uh, started in our local health departments. We are seeing an increased rate of use among African-Americans. Uh, the numbers aren't high like we see in, uh, uh, in the white population, but it's kind of like Dr. Stack showed with, with the numbers in Madison County and y'all going from fourth to six, um, the, num the absolute numbers are going up and the rates are going up in the African American population. So how do we reach out to a, a community that is suspicious of, um, of uh, medical intervention, suspicious of, are you really just trying to, to trap me into, so law enforcement can come out of the back room and arrest me? Uh, we have had such a um, mis- uh, misappropriation of, of arrests. And, and, and if you look at prison rates of people who have, uh, of the African-American community uh, and the, the drug use, uh, 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 diag uh, not diagnosis, I'm sorry, I'm still talking like a physician. I have to go in. Uh, Van Ingram keeps telling me, Connie, they don't discharge people from prison. They get released. So I use my, get my terms mixed up. But, but people had been imprisoned because of drug use uh, and drug convictions. And so it's, it's a delicate balance. And we have to diversify our work, uh, our workforce, because me as an older white female, um, me giving a message to someone, uh, it's not going to resonate. It's going to resonate when we have a diverse population of young people of different races, uh, of trans people that are out there working uh, on the front lines so that people can trust us. We learned that in public health a long time ago. We have to have the population to trust the messenger. And it can be the best messenger in the world, but if it's not someone that you trust, you're not gonna take that message to heart. So, so getting, uh, uh, designing programs, going and outreaching uh, to areas where you think you're going to get your best, uh, your best results is, is what you're going to need to do. I hope that answers that question. Oh, that definitely answers that question. Thank you so much, Connie. Uh, we've got another question that's coming in from a business standpoint, presumably an HR standpoint. What can organizations do and on the prevention side 
of OUD SUD to try to, to curtail it at the front of the of the issue. Well, one of my favorite stories is uh, Dr. Artis Hoven, who is the medical director for CURP and, and, and a friend, a good friend, uh, was kind of did our original, I called it our dog and pony show when we were going out to lots of different health, uh, different counties and talking to them about harm reduction and the importance of SSPs. And she went to a county in Eastern Kentucky and they asked her to come and talk to the board of the local bank. It was a small community. There was one major bank in the area and they wanted to understand harm reduction and how was that important for them? And after she explained harm reduction, after she explained what happens to communities when substance use disorder takes over their workforce and takes over their family structures in that community, this group at this board of, of, of the uh, bank were 100% supportive and helped to get the SSP passed uh, the ordinance to develop an SSP in that community. They were the movers and shakers because they understood that a substance use disorder um, undercutting their whole community, it was going to affect their worst force, which is going to affect their tax base, which is going to affect how they can help with roads and with schools and, and with uh, all of the things that make that community a place that people want to live. So you, you don't have to go very far to say, do you want to pay for a syringe that is going to keep someone from getting HIV or hepatitis C? Or do you want to pay for the medications for a lifetime for someone, hospitalizations, uh, not only for HIV, but a hospitalization for uh, a, a valve transplant for the, the uh, medical conditions Dr. Stack was talking about, soft tissue uh, injury for limb loss. Uh, the, the, the cost, if you look at that, is, is it's not, not even hard. I'm an obstetrician and I can do the math on that. Uh, we are getting ready to have an article that's going to be printed in the Journal of Rural Health, which our Medicaid group uh, here and our office of analytics in the cabinet did, where it showed that if you look at an SSP in a community and you match that with the medical expenses in Medicaid for and, and, and uh, we, we listed a whole bunch of medical issues that can be related to substance use disorder, like we just talked about, valve replacement, soft tissue injury, all of those things. They found that the longer an SSP had been in place in that community, their number of, of uh, Medicaid charges for those particular medical conditions went down. They showed that the Medicaid actually spent less money on these complications the longer an SSP was in, in that community. So that's going to be published in, in the fall. We're very excited about that. And we hope that that will be a way that we can show legislators and business people. I think the business people already get it, but it, it will help our legislatures to understand those dollars and cents that go along with all of those important lives that, that we're talking about affecting. Uh, in in uh, and just real quickly in uh, uh, Scott County, Indiana, uh, uh, where they have just recently, as of the end of December, they are going to do away with their SSP. And that is where the, the huge HIV outbreak happened uh, a few years ago. And one of the, the people on that board said, well, if the HIV cases start going up, we'll reinstitute that. Talk about looking at life completely backwards. We want to wait until we've got people that we need to treat whose lives are disrupted before we uh, go back to doing what worked in the past. It, it, it's hard for me to even believe people would have that thought process. I, I think that's definitely an important thing to, to note. And it's, uh, it's it'll be great when that report comes out because it's, yes. it's going to be really good to be able to show actual savings versus costs. Um, and this next question that's coming through is Related to that, you might have addressed it a little bit, but it says, I work with judge executives and mayors who, all, who are all looking for ways to assist. What would you recommend for local governments to do when it comes to this issue? I think what might be helpful for them is uh, for us to connect them to a community that has seen the uh, and, and that should be most any community that has an SSP. I mean, we have 63 uh, counties right now that have an SSP, but if we can connect 
that one judge executive to another judge executive, even ones who say, you know, I was just hesitant at the beginning and I didn't quite get it in my health department, my board of health, my local uh, uh, medical staff, uh, the families who are uh, in recovery or the families who have lost someone to this fight. Uh, once they explained this to me and I understood the basis of harm reduction, we have seen success in our community. And so I think, you know, again, I'm an obstetrician and talking to a county judge executive, there's going to be some eye rolling and they're going to say, well, what does she know? But if you've got talk conversation with peers, with other county judge executives, other mayors, uh, other police chiefs, other sheriffs, and we can help you get in contact with those folks because we have people who have said, I wasn't a believer, I am now, and I'm happy to talk to people about this. I think those connections are, are vital for us uh, to, to further the use of the, the importance and elevate harm reduction in our communities. Absolutely, absolutely. So here's a, a question that's coming through that we haven't talked much about is uh, the youth side of things when it comes to prevention. So the question is, how can we effectively share the magnitude of this problem to our youth? And the there's such an issue with harm reduction and the youth. I mean, there's the overlap there. Could you discuss that briefly? Well, let me go back because I didn't answer a question earlier. I, I got talking and, and got off track. Uh, we were, someone was asking about the ages. We were seeing our overdose mostly in our 45 and older group uh, with 35 to 45 in the second tier. And in this last report, we had the 35 to 45 is our higher group by a little bit. So our ages of overdoses are going down. So younger people are overdosing. How do we approach the youth? Um, you know, I was a youth one time and, and I didn't listen to a lot of people. Uh, it, it, it is hard. Uh, but that's because our harm reduction message is not one message. It's kind of like I tell people when they go, well, what's the answer? My, my response is, well, what's the question? There's not just one question. There's a lot of questions. So there's a lot of answers. So how we approach youth is also something that we need to get peer champions uh, doing and find those peer champions that we can help educate and use them to reach out to their peers uh, and make sure they understand. And as Dr. Stack said, you know, these, these are decisions that, that they can make now um, that can be irreparably harmful. Uh, cocaine, you use cocaine once, you have an arrhythmia, you, you may not make it through that. Um, but they don't really hear that when, it, again, it comes from someone uh, in, a, in, a, in a position of authority. Uh, we have to tailor, we have to look at things out there that work. There are programs out there, evidence-based programs that people have instituted that are, are helpful to reach those kids. And so we can't have a harm reduction program. We have a harm reduction program with many, many layers, and we have to approach each of those groups in a separate, unique way. I, I definitely agree with you. Um, so there's also been a, a dramatic correlation between COVID and the overdose crisis currently. I mean, you can see the numbers going up 50% in a single year. And over time, it's difficult to make a, make a to judge a trend based on such a short amount of time. But assuming that the COVID crisis de decreases over time, do you believe, or do you have any evidence to suggest that the correlation will continue? Once COVID gets better, do you think that the overdose rates will begin to drop or is there any evidence to the contrary? Well, you're right. We don't have any evidence. We have crystal balls. Uh, I think Dr. Zabel, who's going to be your next speaker, could, could give a, a much better insight because he spent his whole life studying uh, the, the phenomena that goes on. He's, he's a medical anthropologist, which I love to say because I agree with Dr. Stack. That's just such a cool thing to think about being a medical anthropologist. But, but um, we do know that that increase went up when COVID was uh, at, at not at the highest, uh, certainly if we were looking for incidence rate and overdoses, you would have seen that December and January. We saw our increases in 
April when everyone's world was turned upside down when we were doing a healthy at home. But we also saw a big change in our fentanyl traffic. And the fentanyl traffic, I think, had a huge influence on what's going to happen. We are starting to see increases in overdoses uh, that happened this spring of 2021. If you remember, April of 2021, our numbers were down. Things were opening up. Uh, I think we're going to need more than two, two data points, to, as you said, to find a trend. I think that we're not going to be able to know completely what's happened until we are further out and can look back at all the factors. But I, I'm, I'm more concerned about the trend of fentanyl and how it's getting into our, our communities. And I know someone answered in the in the chat about how uh, that um, uh, fentanyl is getting into our communities. It's going right down I-75. I mean, it's, it's the traffic pattern that we've seen before. And as Dr. Stack says, once it gets in the community, you see it, you know it's there until it, it con in, until that, that particular shipment is gone. Uh, and uh, so I don't think, again, there's not one answer because there's not one question. There is such a complicated medical condition uh, and there are so many complicated ways that it affects and it's gonna affect one person differently than another. Sorry about that. I think you're definitely right there. I think there's thousands of questions that we can that we need to answer, and it's it's definitely a very complicated issue. Um, I think we've pretty much addressed all the questions in the Q and A. Do you have any closing remarks you'd like to make, or any any takeaways that you'd like to express? I just think that that we need to uh, not be discouraged. Uh, I think we need to put our heads down and just keep doing things that we know that work, uh, and be open for new ideas, be open for new evidence-based models, apply for this extended funding. We only have about 16 SSPs that have applied and, and we've got some money that can help people do innovative things. So you can work with this funding, you can look at wound centers, we can connect you with other uh, areas that are doing wound care. Uh, learn from each other, learn from the national information, what Dr. Isabella is getting ready to, to present to you. Um, don't be discouraged. You are making a difference. You have saved lives. You'll never know it. You'll never know how many. You don't know that person that's in front of you today that you talk to. You don't know that ripple effect and how many other people you have helped. But keep getting the naloxone out there. Keep testing people. Keep loving people. Keep encouraging people. And please encourage each other. This is a time when we need to wrap our arms around each other and understand that we're all trying to do this for the good of our other Kentuckians and uh, and we're going to get to a place that SSPs will be something no one thinks about because it's always been there. Uh, caring for people and, and not even thinking about stigma will come. And it's going to be because of the work you're doing today that's going to make that happen for our future and for our children's future. So thank you so much for what you do. I think that is an excellent way of an excellent synopsis of the the two presentations. It's 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 bleak, but it's we keep trying and it'll get better. Yeah, um, yeah. I would like to offer a as sincere thank you to both you and Dr. Stack for your presentations here today. Your work does not go unnoticed, and your leadership in the field of public health in the state is greatly greatly appreciated. 